your host, Brian Lin, and hope you had a wonderful weekend. As usual, during the live stream, you can ask us any questions in the chat, and we will do our best to answer them. You can also sign up to be a performer for these masterclasses by visiting our website, and you will get the chance to perform for our live audience. Today's guest teacher, Dr. Alex McDonald, is the festival director for Basically Beethoven at Dallas, Texas a thriving summer concert series in downtown D Dallas Arts District. His students have been admitted to Juilliard and Eastman, Texas, and Eastman. Texas Music Teachers Association recently awarded him the 2017 Outstanding Achievement Award in Teaching. You can learn more about him at his website at alexmcdonaldpiano.com. Welcome to the show, Alex. Hi. How are you doing on this fine day? I'm doing well. Um, I'm indoors, uh, which is a good place to be in Texas, both for the virus and the weather anyway. So it's a very smart decision to stay indoor. And uh, it's the whole reason that the series got to take take off so that people mm. can still enjoy piano activities at home. That's a so wonderful thing. thank you. Um, I'm very happy that you're here. And the topic that we're going to talk about today is how to avoid injuries. And uh, the exact title is Four Strategies for Avoiding and Recovering from Injuries. So first of all, I would like to ask you, why um, are we talking about this topic today? Why did you choose this topic? I chose this topic because I have been injured twice. Um, it may come as some surprise to people that injuries are something that can happen to a pianist, but they absolutely can, and they can be devastating for a, for a person, especially if you've invested years and years of your life. So um, prior to getting injured, I was a very robust practicer by any measure. For about four years, I was averaging eight hours each day. Um, you know, I, I would go through a lot of rep. It was very exciting. It was fun to work that hard and to grow, but I was also pushing myself pretty hard too. And I wasn't listening to signs that my body was getting too tense. Um, there was also a buildup of psychological tension. Uh, my freshman year of college, first year away from home, um, a new teacher that um, had kind of intimidated me a little bit, to, to put it nicely. Um, and uh, after the fourth year of working that hard, uh, my body broke, as it were. I felt a sharp shooting pain through my, uh, through my left arm. I still remember the exact chord when it happened. Ironically, it was not in a very hard piece. It was in, um, in Beethoven Opus 110 over here, sorry, right here, this chord. There was a nice little twist right here in my arm, looked like this from the angle, and uh, that, that was all it took. Shooting pain, I knew immediately I'd been injured. Um, couldn't play much. Um, I uh, went on to, uh, started seeing various therapists and specialists I saw Oh goodness, I saw two neurologists. They did an electrolysis test to make sure there wasn't nerve entrapment. I saw a surgeon who was ready to operate that very day, it seemed, with not enough evidence to justify it. That was terrifying. Um, chiropractor, um, I saw an orthopedist, you name it. I, I basically tried it. Um, and then finally I started doing uh, physical therapy that involved massaging and ultrasound and even running an electric current through my arm. I'm not sure what the electric current was for, but it sounds exciting and medieval. So, you know, kids don't try this at home. Uh, so, uh, they, they had a specific technique for it. Um, and um, I also was put on a very strict practice recovery um, regimen. First of all, they would give me like this putty that I would practice you know, exercising my fingers with. And I was allowed to practice um, at first six minutes a day in three two minute sets. I remember after my first set, I realized that I'd accidentally gone two minutes and 30 seconds. And I was like, oh no, I just went 25% too long in my first set. I have to be more careful. Um, and my, uh, it was just a very long, long journey. If I felt okay, I was allowed to add one minute and by the end of that year, end of my sophomore year, I had gotten back up to about three hours or so and was able to give a, you know, a very short recital. Uh, junior year, recovered more. Senior year, was ready to get back to competing again um, and do my college auditions. And uh, lo and behold, I got a second injury. This time it was in both arms. 
by this point, I was getting quite discouraged. Um, I, I knew that I had to change my environment because, uh, you know, it happened twice in the same place and whatever the cause, it wouldn't be wise to stay. So um, I tried to, um, I wanted to go to Juilliard for my master's since they have teachers like uh, Veda Kaplinsky and Julian Martin who are specialists on technique, really. Um, I, um, after, after I'll, I'll just say everything, I got waitlisted. I was not thrilled to be waitlisted, but given the fact that I could only practice one hour and my program took an hour and a half to play, I uh, had to be more or less okay with that. Uh, thankfully, I got through. Um, I felt like I was in a very different place as a player. I, I used to like think of myself as a pretty com uh, successful competitor, and now I'm on like a wait list. What does that mean for me? Um, and actually, I remember my dad saying to me, "Son, how much longer are you going to keep doing this?" And it's like, you know, it's like, well, you know, I want to give it a little more time. I, um, I, I went to, uh, I got into to Juilliard's Masters. Um, had to take out a lot of loans for it was um and, and then i was getting teaching from both kaplinski and and martin um i uh i started taking alexander technique just totally on a whim because it was something i hadn't tried and it was something you could take there for free they also had physical therapists that you could go to and i began to study a technique that's called taubman technique now i don't think um veda kaplinski and julian martin teach a pure taubman they they just they apply it as they see best and they're very good teachers and they do very well with that. But um, so I learned a kind of Taubman. Um, I had to extend my master's a third year to give myself more time to integrate. But I was able to play long programs and harder pieces again and finally compete again and, you know, place in a couple of, you know, medium-ish level things. Um, and that is sort of my story. Um, but I had to sort of learn a lot about technique and the process. It was a lot of trial and error. Um, the injury first happened in the summer of 2002, which means that for 18 years I've been, you know, thinking about injuries, technique, um, all of those things. So, um, and needless to say, when you become an injured musician, other injured musicians um, often want to talk to you. So you, you learn about their experiences as well. So that's the backstory of how I became interested um, in injuries. That I think that's uh, thank you so much for sharing this very personal story. Uh, I think uh, from you, and I think one of the things that people don't realize is how much physicality it takes. Uh, pianists uh, they they usually only hear you know the music, the beautiful music, but it's really in a way um, you know half a sport, or someone say some some would say that it's 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 a full sport. So. Um, I'm very glad that uh, you were able to recover from it. And that's the whole point of, like you said, the whole point of our talk today is to avoid this uh, happening to more people. So why don't you um, go ahead and share with us, you know, some of the, the strategies that people can take that you've learned um, to avoid injuries. Yeah. yeah thank you, Brian. I, I think... Um... Avoiding is really what you want to do. Once an injury happens, it's it's very hard to move past it because the way you injured yourself is frighteningly repeatable. It's not like I was um, walking around and I accidentally fell into an open sewer hole and ah, I fell into the hole. Shoot, I should watch out for those, you know and. You know, it's fairly easy to avoid, right? No, instead, it's just the act of playing. And, and that can really inhibit your freedom of expression if you think that the act of playing is what hurts you. So as much as you can, it is good to try to avoid it ever happening in the first place. Okay, so backstory. I think one way that you can avoid injuries is be aware of what your technique actually is. You can analyze your technique. Um, if your technique is 100% intuitive and you don't have to think about it at all and you just feel amazing and you have no problems, then maybe this isn't the talk for you. Because something that Veda used to say that I think is really true is don't fix something that's not broken. If you're doing fine, why deconstruct? But most of us feel varying levels of discomfort or inefficiency. And so it's good to, um, to know 
what it is. So analyze your technique. What were you taught? Um, some of the things that I was taught as a younger pianist involved, um, well, first of all, curve your fingers, you know, have a good, good, strong curve. Um, don't bounce your wrist. And so one of the ways that uh, that was addressed was my teacher would put a, a quarter or an eraser on my wrist and I wasn't allowed to let that, that quarter fall on the ground. It's very stressful <laughs> watching that quarter, trying to not let it fall. Um, I really wanted to just tape the darn thing on there, but, um, things of that nature, um, shoulders down. I was, I was taught some very good things. Um, looking back, I now see that what I was taught was a system that was very useful for a certain kind of student, but the more complex and nuanced the works became, the more the technique needed to become nuanced. And so I had to learn wrist flexibility. Uh, my teacher at the time was trying to stop this. You know, every teacher has had some of these along the way. The kid just like bounces their wrist on every note. I can just imagine the teacher being like, Ugh, well, we'll fix this. I know, quarter, don't let it fall off. Immediately, the teacher feels satisfaction because the student finally realizes the vile thing that they were committing, except that now that has translated for some people to a stiff wrist. Here's the thing. You don't know that it's going to translate to a stiff wrist when you're teaching a five-year-old. You don't know that in 15 years that they're going to not know how to release their wrist and end up becoming very tense. Um, so it's a, it's a tricky, tricky reality. But we're taught many different things, aren't we? Some teachers teach you to curve and lift your finger. And then it's a matter of degree, right? Do they teach you to curve and lift a lot <laughs> or a little bit? Um, I, I remember, um, Brian, have you seen the, I'm sure you've seen the long, long teaching videos. The long, uh, well, I've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of them. Which one is exactly are you referring to? I'm, I'm thinking of, of video number one where he's <laughs> at his upright piano and he's like, so first we do the C major scale and he goes, yes. And then pretty soon like, I have definitely seen, seen those. Yes, I have. Um, and of course the faster he goes, the more efficient everything becomes. But sadly, uh, my mom and I had a couple of students who watched these videos, thought, oh, Long Long's a great virtuoso. We must copy him. And next thing I know, fingers are just like flying up as high as they can. And it's like, you know, how do I, how do I get him to see that like, yes, you do want some definition to the fingertip, but how much? Um, another thing that I was taught that I have to keep an eye on is like arm weight. Okay, what does that mean, arm weight? You know, you want to have some support in the finger, but does that mean arm heaviness? Does that mean you're pushing on the bottom of the key? Um, you, you know, there's just, there are so many kinds of techniques that people teach to solve different kinds of problems. And maybe it's very well suited for one problem, but maybe it creates another issue. Maybe you're constantly taught finger legato that you must never release. Um, or maybe you're taught the opposite and more of a Taubman approach is to release everything. And, um, and so I think it's just without necessarily judging what you were taught, it's just good to be aware of what you were taught. Um, and then if you're having trouble, a part of analyzing your technique would be to learn new approaches. If you've been taught that everything must be finger legato, it might be good to develop a healthy appreciation for why Taubman says to release everything. Um, or um, if you've been taught to really work your fingers, maybe it's good to learn how the forearm rotates or the wrist moves in and out. Or if you were taught everything from back here and going in, maybe it's good to focus on the definition of the fingers. Basically, there's a lot of facets to technique. Um, my theory is that it's very difficult for us teachers to really keep a comprehensive view of all aspects and to know precisely what a student needs, to know precisely how they hear it. I mean, we all have limitations. Student has limitations, teacher has limitations, the method of communication has limitations. And so we need to try to analyze our understanding of it so that we can broaden it. Um, now, I personally, as I've kind of alluded already, I benefited greatly from the Taubman approach with its emphasis on freedom of rotation and arm movement. But even with that, I had to go backwards a little bit and say, okay, but I still have to move my fingers. Uh, the reason I'm saying that is because Taubman sometimes has to articulate rotation in such a way that I, I think it's almost custom built for the overactive finger, the overactive hand. And so um, I, I had to, you know, kind of move away from it for a while, but then I had to come back and say, okay, well, what are healthy methods of finger movement? Um, because 
I don't think it's a good thing if your technique becomes a straight jacket. If you have a technique that says you must only move your fingers, but you cannot move your arm, that's a straight jacket. If you have a technique that says you must move your arm, do not lift your fingers, or something horrible will happen to you, that's a straight jacket. So, you know, these are just, I think these are different ways of, they're different ways of, of looking at and trying to understand what you do and, and developing a healthy appreciation for other approaches. That is, that is roughly point number one. And, and I think kind of related to that is if you are injured, um, research different treatments. Um, don't, don't settle on just one and say, this is the one that's gonna get me there. Most people I've talked to that were injured had to kind of create their own cocktail of approaches. For me, it involved Taubman, um, Alexander Technique, um, a little bit of help from a, a chiropractor in the area who's also, actually was a former student of Martin Durand. Um, so he was, he was quite a decent pianist back in the day. And then some very bizarre pieces of advice that would probably make very little sense to some people, but really helped me. Um, you know, just, it, you have to research. It's kind of a seek and ye shall find kind of thing. So that's, that's point one. Gotcha. And um, just on a, I had a question on that, um, but it might touch some of your uh, future points. So just keep the keep it in the back of your mind if if, if it does. I was wondering, you know, it's, since it's so um, important to individualize, you know, what each students need, or you know, what what your what you yourself need. How is there, you know? How did you figure out, you know, what what sort of things do you look for in a student's technique that goes, you know, that that kind of is like a red flag or or you know something that that you can notice that that can help you identify those those problems and in uh, as a result, you know, make a appropriate strategy for it. So I guess just the question is, you know, how do you um, you know, more specifically, uh, design a strategy that's good for your students or, you know, for yourself. But just something to keep uh, at the back of your mind as you go on uh, to sure, your sure. your other strategies. Yeah, I think, I think that question deserves special attention um, because it's, that's a tough one to answer. But one thing that I always thought was so amazing that Julian Martin could do in particular was he could just listen to your sound and from your sound, he knew if you felt uncomfortable. Uh, a free and, and for those of uh, us who don't know, Julie Martin is a professor at Juilliard. And just an <laughs> utter genius, just an utter genius. One of the most brilliant people I've ever known. Um, mm -hmm. If you ever have the chance to meet him, stand in awe and don't say too much. Uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> so I guess one trick is to really train your ears and, and really right. be able to listen to the sound, I guess. He, he has an excellent... Uh, way of knowing if the sound is open or closed. An efficient movement tends to make for a more open sound. And, um, and so you can kind of train your ear to sort of make that associ association with, and, and another way is like, you know, when you hear a scale passage, does it feel even or does it sound bumpy? Does it sound like um, someone is having trouble or does it seem relatively easy for them to do? Um, another way is just, um, you know, if you watch really efficient pianists enough, you'll develop a sense of what looks efficient and what looks inefficient. And of course, lots of practicing and watching yourself videos are good as well. Um, but I think those are some ways to kind of develop a sense of, does it look right? Does it sound right? If you're not sure, just get a question mark and maybe ask someone, you know? Right. If you don't have anyone nearby, you could always ask someone in another area too, you know, so. Understood. Anyway, that, that's, my, that's my thought. Um, Great. I'm sure, I'm sure there's more one could say, but uh, so my, my yeah. second idea, sure. the first one was analyze your technique. Second one is listen to your body and also listen to your mind. Um, so if you do not listen to your body, technique will be less effective. So you could learn a set of techniques. They could be the best techniques. And yet if you don't really listen to how things feel to yourself, you won't really have a good framework for knowing if it's the right amount. Um, a lot of really good piano students are very good at executing tasks, especially if they were delivered with clarity and a certain degree of force. Um, and so if we don't know how to listen to our body, we don't know if it feels right. So here's what I mean. For example, I would say to somebody that when you're playing the piano, 
you have a movement in the finger, a movement in the wrist that can be circular. There's a in and out movement from the shoulder. There's a rotation in the elbow. And um, there's a certain freedom from the neck. There's even a little movement at this joint right here. All kinds of places. Okay, so how do you know how much to do? Well, you have to listen to your body and see if it feels right. Um, one area where I think that um, this is very critical is um, we, and this is a point that Veda likes to make, and it's very well taken. Um, if, we, if we've always felt a certain amount of tension, we might not realize that we're feeling tension because it's what's normal to us. So um, it's, it's, we, don't, we don't know what it's like to be without that tension because it's just always there. Imagine if you had only in your entire life listened to recordings that were uh, in the 1950s. Okay, uh, nothing newer than that. Uh, you wouldn't know what it's like to be without that static, to have a more clear sound with you know, the, the higher, higher definition audio that we're now capable of today. Um, similarly, we have this tension that exists in our body. And one of the things that you learn in Alexander Technique in particular is learning how to listen to your body and finding that tension. Um, the problem with this quiet, silent tension that you might not notice is that it can begin to build. And usually when it does build, that becomes the first clue to a pianist that something is wrong. It's, it's a more uncomfortable state than it was before. There was probably a relatively benign amount that was already there, but then it begins to flare up, maybe practicing a hard passage for a prolonged period of time, trying a new technique, being nervous under pressure, or just getting older, I hate to say. Uh, these things can all um, cause us to begin to feel increases. Um, now, so we've gone from having quiet tension to beginning to feel it increasing. We have to not ignore it because that's your body telling you something. If your body is saying this does not feel good and you proceed anyway, um, the body can begin to fray, it can begin to swell, it can begin to lose um, control. Um, I do think it's worth saying that when one ignores technique, or, or sorry, excuse me, when one um, pays attention to tension, the goal is not to become gushy, like relaxed in a, in a kind of gelatin sort of way. There has to be definition. But, um, but what I'm really trying to say is listening to the body takes a lot of self-discipline. Um, it's not as easy as it sounds. I think it takes really several years of just as you're playing saying, how does this feel? Could this feel better? Maybe you can find other passages in the piece that feel amazing and then ask yourself, why does this passage not feel as good? Just knowing that it doesn't feel ideal is a step toward the solution. It may not feel like a very positive step, but you can't fix it if you don't know there's a problem there. And then I also uh, wrote in my notes that we should also listen to our minds. Um, I think anxiety has, a, has a, a way of increasing tension as well. And so it's, it's really worth um, taking stock to see, like, am I, am I feeling overly anxious? Am I feeling defeated by music or by life? Um, because these things can really have an impact in our ability to release, um, to not hold things down, to be able to move exactly the amount we want to move and no further. So... Um, Believe it or not, actually, part of my recovery from injury actually was a little bit of counseling. <laughs> so um, that did happen. So um, that's point number two. Anything you want to interject, Brian? Or I really like your point about um, not just that the solution isn't a, you know, um, a straight jacket, which is, you know, uh, I guess relaxing is also another straight jacket, right? Like mm -hmm. a lot of people just say, you know, just relax. And as a result, everything becomes just really soft. And I think finding that balance between, um, you know, not being too tense and not being too relaxed is a, a, a I guess, a, a topic for another day that you could go on and, 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 and elaborate for, 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 you know, another three hours. But I just, I just, I just like to point out that I really like that you, you mentioned it. It's a tough topic. I know I've known people who've tried to relax everything and felt weirdly tight in all these strange places. It's like they, they don't know how to come to terms with the fact that playing requires movement. And so I think that the goal is not relaxation. The goal is efficiency. 
And when you move efficiently, then you feel free to move in the right ways. Relaxation is really not the right word. Relaxation is what we do at night when we've had a glass of wine and are ready for bed. Um, you know, whatever. <laughs> exactly. Not not really. Not really. Doesn't really work when you are trying to to practice and polish something. <laughs> exactly. Ah, I see. Right. I need to speak more quickly because yes. time is passing. Let's. Yeah, I'll let you talk about your last two points. Okay. Okay. So, um, third thing is develop healthy practice habits. I think one of the best ways to um, be healthy in playing and to avoid injury is to have a good work rest balance. This is hard to do when we are trying our very best to feel successful. And in my opinion, one of the curses of modern or postmodern or whatever you want to call it culture is that it's extremely self actualizing. You have to build your own identity. And there are many good things about this, but one of the bad ones is it kind of becomes up to you to validate yourself. Like if you can't find yourself or successfully become what you are, then you can end up feeling like you have failed at life. And this can result in a lot of overwork and the inability to rest. If you can't rest, you can't heal. Um, I, I like to look back to the wisdom of, of the ancient Hebrews who would even give the land a whole year off. It could just grow whatever it wanted to grow for a year. So that, and, and it was actually very wise that let the, the soil regain nutrients. Um, I think similarly, we have to find healthy work rest patterns so that our body has a chance to recover. Um, you know, if you're practicing octave etude for four hours straight, you are asking for it. <laughs> you know, there has to be a sense of winter rest. Um, and, and also the rest needs to have a certain consistency to it and the work has to have a certain consistency to it. I've actually had students who were dealing with tension and they seem to not be able to get past it. And we were kind of stuck on this, oh, I felt a twinge, oh, I felt something. And, and so the advice, it was a little bit of a gamble to be honest, was all right, I want you just to practice this passage 20 minutes every day, unless you're screaming in pain, just do it. And I wanna see at the end of two weeks if, if it actually goes away. And interestingly, it did. I think it's because the body, if you give it a chance, it's quite flexible. It, it can learn to adapt to things. And I think she learned how to be efficient and she really needed a consistent, modest goal. 20 minutes a day should not kill you. 15 even. Just, you know, just finding that consistency. And then once that was achieved, add five minutes. After that, add five minutes. So the solution for her was not finding a more efficient way to move her wrist. It was just making sure that she didn't get into this unhealthy pattern of binge practicing because I have a deadline and then binge resting. Oh, I have to recover. You want to try to find healthy consistency. So look for consistent work and consistent rest. Um, fourth point is, um, sounds a little cheesy and a little American, I guess, but don't give up um, is the fourth point. Don't give up. Um, you know, sometimes when we watch other people play, it just looks like they have no trouble. And then we look at ourselves and we think, oh, woe is me, <laughs> I cannot do it. Um, but we don't know what they actually feel. Um, we only know what we, we feel ourselves. And um, there were a lot of places where I could have given up. And um, you know, I know there are better pianists than me out there, but I'm so grateful that I'm able to play again. I'm grateful that I was able to compete in Clyburn. You know, I'm grateful that I was able to you know, learn, learn some, I, I learned Rachmaninoff three after my injury. I'm very proud of that. Um, and, uh, and without a teacher, um, I'm sure a teacher would have made it sound better, but, but I did it, you know, and, um, and I just, I don't know what I'm trying to say is, um, I'm naturally a pretty stiff person. If I can do it, I'm pretty sure you can do it too, whoever you are. And, um, you know, just, I, I think any path going anywhere is going to have bumps and it takes a great deal of perseverance to be able to um, to get anywhere in life so you know it's kind of a seek and you shall find method if you will so that's those are my four points just to summarize analyze your technique listen to your body and mind develop healthy practice habits and don't give up <laughs> i really i do think um the last point uh, of, of not giving up is very important especially at today's time where it could feel a little bit just, you know, what's the right word? But during this, you know, pandemic, I, I'm sure a lot of people are having a tough time, um, you know, whether it's mentally or, or just, you know, practically, you well, know. 
<laughs> not to not to sound flattering, but one of the great things that you're doing is you're giving people a venue to play. And if you don't have a chance to play, it's hard to practice. Yes, so exactly. People, that's you, you got to have a platform to present your work. That's you know, so. yes. That's the hope. Yes. Um, so we are at uh, eight thirty. However, I think uh, the next person is still not on yet. So we have a little more time um, to, to, to chat a little bit more um, until, until they come. And I'll, I've, I've reached out, uh, I've, I've asked my team to reach out to that person. Um, do you have um, anything you would like to uh, elaborate or anything? Um, let's see. So you talked about, um, let, let's, let's talk about your, 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 Point three, healthy habit a little more. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned, um, you know, just having a, a, a practice schedule, right? Mm -hmm. of, of, of a consistent practice schedule and not, right. um, not leaving everything until the last minute. What oh, do yeah. you think is a, the golden um, <laughs> hours of, of practicing every day? Is there, is there, is there, you know, is there such a thing as practicing too little or too much? I think so. <laughs> but that's very hard to define. It right. really depends on what your goals are. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're trying to be a professional musician, unless you are just like some kind of genius, I, you, I mean, I, I have a hard time seeing how you're going to get by with less than three hours. I don't know. I feel like right, so three good. hours would be a minimum if you want to be want to a professional. I think so. Okay. And I think if you go over the eight marker for a prolonged period of time, you know, it's um, it's also That's difficult when... to sustain life when you're doing that much. You're pretty uh, much just a little practice dribble <laughs> going into your little circular thing, just doing your... But maybe it's good to do for a while. I don't know. I mean, it's tough. I mean, unless you're long, long, right? Because he practiced... I think like 10 to 12 hours a day with, with no break. <laughs> well, that's, with that's very little break. I but. tried to do 14 once because I had read somewhere that lists did that and I made it to 13 and a half hours and I couldn't get that last 30 minutes in. And then I was like tired for a week. <laughs> wow. I, I don't think I've ever gone that long. I think the longest I've gone was maybe 10. That's pretty long. Yeah. <laughs> that's really, really you know, long. you know, if you had, if you had a full day, you know, it, it actually, you know, four hours in the morning, four hours in the afternoon, two hours at night or something like that. You know, if you break it into different parts. <laughs> I actually did six hours before lunch when I did that. I got up at six. I had an uh -huh. upright in my room. I literally just rolled out of bed, went to the bathroom and just started practicing. I think I went from like 6.15 to 12.15. Wow. And then ate lunch, gave myself like an hour, but I couldn't break for too long because I knew if I took a long break, I wasn't going to get back to it. And then it was by the evening or it was just sort of like, I was like uh, Frodo trying to carry the ring up to Mount Doom. Every step was just getting a little bit harder. So. <laughs> gotcha. Anyway. Gotcha. Anyways, I do see our um, performer on in the backstage uh, already. So I will bring, we'll bring her in. Great. Her name is uh, Serena. So welcome, Serena. <laughs> How are you doing? Can you hear us, Serena? Sir, oops. Well, <laughs> you know, technology these days. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I found that a lot of a lot of um, of my friends are are jumping into you know the whole online, uh, whether it's teaching, live streaming. Everyone is becoming more and more of a a, a technology expert, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> And I, I find myself, I've invested in a lot of equipments um, on that as well. So Serena is back again. Wonderful. Wonderful. Hi, Serena. Can you hear us? Yeah. Great. Welcome to uh, our master class. Thank you so much. Oops. And, uh, um, and uh, where are you joining us from? Sorry, what'd you say? Um, where are you joining us from today? New York. New York. Welcome, welcome. So um, I'll hand this uh, over to uh, Alex and you, and I hope you guys have a wonderful class. I'll be in the backstage uh, in case you guys need help. Thank you, Brian. Right. 
Okay. Hi, Serena. What would you like to start with? On you at? Wonderful. I look forward to it. try to um, do even more with the way that you shape the phrasing. Um, I heard some very nice shaping and I want to just see if I can, you know, take it even a little bit further. Um, this first sentence, Alex, yes, I think I think Serena uh, is having some technical issues. So she just dropped out again. Ah. And she's back on. It's <laughs> it, it's just it's a symbolization of of how we have to cope with technology these days, I think. Oh, I know. I, I <laughs> there we go. This happens to me too. Right. No worries. Hello, Serena. Good to see you again. Um, so let's take a look at these phrases. First one could be... And then let's say the second one is... So the first phrase, um, what kind of a statement is that? What do you think? Um, could you, um, you were kind of cutting it in. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Here we go. Did that come through? Yeah. Okay, so. What I'm thinking is that, that that sentence could be like a question and we could play it in a way that makes it seem like uh, we're asking something. We're waiting for information. And then since we have a question, we're waiting for the answer. And there's our answer. So could you play these first two phrases in a way that make me feel not satisfied at the end of the first phrase maybe a little bit of a of a crescendo at the end and then let it fade at the very end of the second phrase okay thank you <laughs> lovely 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 and at the end of the second phrase you may have done this but um, could it come down just a little bit more? So, ya da dee da dee da softer there. And I'm using my hand to do this because I don't know how much dynamics are coming through across the, the, the internet here. But, I uh, Could you try that for me? Uh-oh. I think... I think uh, she must be having a, a, a lot of internet trouble. Oh, she's back. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hello, Serena. Serena, Serena if, if you're having trouble hearing Alex, there's a replay of this online, which should be of a uh, much better quality. So you can always check the replays after after the, the, the video. So Right now, this class is in Rondo form. And you're like the A theme, and you keep coming back. 
I'm just kidding. Um, so could you make that last phrase get softer? Would you try that for me? Could you say that again? Um, could you try the last two me uh, measures, three and four again, and just get a little bit softer as you go? So volume level three, volume level two, volume level one, so that it shapes down. Right, right, exactly. So let us feel like it comes to rest. And honestly, we could just explore that with other other phrases. So uh, similarly, so listen to that phrase, how it comes down as well. Would you try that for me? Could you try that second phrase as well? Start a little bit softer. Crescendo, and then fade. Exactly. So anytime you can find a phrase, just try to start a little bit softer and then let it crescendo. And then after it's peaked at the very end, let it fade. It's like a greater than, less than sign. Um, now, we're taking the repeat, yes? I thought you did a very nice ornament. Could you make the repeat much, much, much softer? So okay. let's say the first time you played it was mezzo forte. The second time, maybe try it with the soft pedal. I'm pushing down the soft pedal so that it's almost like a whisper. I think we have another... Hello, Brian. <laughs> Good to see you again. There we go. There she is. <laughs> Nothing is softer than getting... This is a very out. fun class. Um, right. <laughs> so, Serena, I, I wanted to ask you, are you using the Chrome, uh, are you using the Chrome uh, browser? Are you using a, the Google Chrome browser? Just, just to root out some possibilities. Serena, can, uh, could you hear me? Hmm. Interesting. I think she's lagging again. Indeed. But this proves that this live stream is real. <laughs> no right. editing whatsoever. That's right. So we present whatever is happening at the moment. This so. is raw and authentic. <laughs> you have seen exactly what happens. There's no whitewashing here. <laughs> this is the C span of piano master classes. Exactly. <laughs> and and uh, this is almost a, uh, if not daily, a weekly uh, frustration that, that, that we as piano teachers uh, have. Uh, when, ever, we, ever since we switched online, I think, there's always a lot of trouble with that. I don't know very many teachers who really were excited about teaching online until COVID happened. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we were all like online teaching. What a <laughs> fabulous idea. Well, I, I investigate this further. Yeah, I actually was uh, teaching um, two students online even before all this happened. Yeah, but I was only using FaceTime um, mm -hmm. and, and none of these. I, I had never heard of Zoom and uh, let alone any other, you know, you know, video conferencing softwares. What softwares and do you use other than Zoom? FaceTime. I was using FaceTime before. Right, right, right. But now, yeah, yeah. now that you've been doing this longer. Um, usually still just Zoom and FaceTime, but um, I've heard uh, things about, mixed things about Google Hangouts uh, or, or Classroom. Mm. And of course, I think the quality of this thing uh, that, that we're using, uh, the live, uh, the restream, uh, it's even though it's a live stream platform, I think the quality is pretty good without any settings. That's so, nice. yeah, um, I the reason I was teaching, you know, uh, online students even before this was because I was teaching some international students. I was teaching oh, Chinese students, uh, and, and I live in the states right now. So, right. Right. Um, that's. 
that's the whole reason why. But I think uh, this happens more often than you think. Mm -hmm. This <laughs> this internet dropout. <laughs> I find that it helps if the student is if they can actually see their router <laughs> as they're playing. If it's if it's really close by, if they. That was another one of, one of the first things I did after COVID happened was I was like shopping around trying to find a longer Ethernet cable. Right. Um, and I, I think I had to drive half an hour to get it because they were going fast. But I found a 50-foot Ethernet cable, and it is not beautiful home decorating. But if you look at the house, there's this bright blue cable running through the home so that the router is close, and I can try to solve latency. And I also upgraded our Internet as well. Right. So those, those helped. Have you also become, do you think you've also become an expert in, in you know, online streaming or, or not streaming, but, you know, conferencing equipment? I wouldn't say expert, but I, I think I'm at least competent now. Right. You know? What do you use uh, when, I, when you well, teach? Well, I actually have some students for whom Zoom does not work for some reason. Oh, I, I don't there you go. I don't why. Probably my most well-to-do student, um, and they are very well-to-do have horrible internet. I think maybe their house is too big. <laughs> so, I hope they're not watching this. I'm very grateful for them. Wonderful student, gifted person. I love you very much. But, uh, from that, they, um, but uh, the internet has just been the worst, and I don't think they realize it. But And so I think there must be more compression in FaceTime, and so that's worked pretty well. And she's back. Hello. Right. <laughs> Hi Serena. Hi, Serena. Uh, so I was I was asking you, were you uh, are you using the Google Chrome um, yes. browser? Okay, great. Mm -hmm. You look um, it right now. Your picture looks a lot clearer. Mm. Whatever you did, mm -hmm. it's great now. That's right. Let's keep great. going. And see All right, let's let's, let's keep going. Okay. So I don't know what has made it through the internet connection and what has not. So I'll just go backwards one bit and say, look for your phrases. And then just remember that they always start less, they grow, and then at the very end, they fade. And while that may sound a little bit like a one-size-fits-all solution, it kind of does. <laughs> and, and it tends to work in a lot of situations. So you could start a little less and grow, slightly taper, and then fade. Start less. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, cool. Wow. Did that make it through? That wasn't like all glitchy and weird? Um, well, um, the picture thing glitched, but the audio didn't. Perfect. You don't need to see what I look like. We just need the sound to work. Um, can you try the first half of the menu up for me one more time? try is when you do the repeat, can you make it like three times softer? I'm, I suggest using the soft pedal so that it's almost like a whisper. Could you give that a try? Uh, do you have a soft pedal on your piano or the left pedal? Or you can just play with like the softest, most precise fingertip you can so that it's like... And that might be a nice change from the first one, you know? And then second time. Can you give it a try? Yeah, absolutely. And I have a very weird approach to getting a softer sound. You ready for a weird practice technique? This might make zero sense. Sometimes to practice softer, or to play softer, I will actually practice really, really loud. Does that sound totally weird? Makes no sense, right? It's like, in order to be hungry, 
I will eat or something. Um, well, mm-hmm. what the way, but what it does is it activates the fingertips and makes them more alert. So let's try it together. Play the first phrase like triple forte, you know. Okay, it's like angry Serena. And then use that same energy that you used to play very loud in a soft performance of it. Give it a try. Sounded very powerful and very scary. I'm afraid of you now. Now, can you use that same energy and play very, very soft? What'd you think? Did that feel like you had any more control? Yeah. Weird, right? Did you think it was going to work? You can be honest. Not really. Ha 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 Yeah, it's, uh, I think first time someone showed it to me, I didn't think it would work either. But I think what happens, Serena, is when we play soft, we start losing control of our fingertips. We think soft. Oh, soft, like, like petting a cat or something. Or, and, but actually to play soft requires more control than playing loud. It takes even more precision. So that's why I think this, this is pretty effective. Um, okay, now let's go to the second half. So I think this is like the heart and soul of the piece. We have these big intervals, this tenth. Can you um, play it with even more passion? Okay. express a lot of emotion, maybe some yelling or some shouting or some crying. We're tired after that, right? It's like, that was exhausting. So for the last statement, can we make it very soft, very inward? Like it's just a conversation between us and ourselves. So. Good. And one last tip to help us know that you're finished and that it's a satisfied finish. Perhaps a slight retardando at the end would feel good. Uh, allow me to demonstrate. And perhaps my retardando is a bit exaggerated, but it gets the point across. And I often think that when we're playing, we should be more clear, overly clear. Like exaggeration is often a good idea. Can you give that a try? Could you slow down even more? Like exaggerate it. Make it so obvious, like this. One, two, three, and one and two and three and one and two and three and one and two and three. That way I know we're done. Think about how like a car stops, right? Um, I'm not talking about those times where um, I don't know, like here. Um, who drives you the most? Who does the most? Who drives you the most in your family? Um, usually we take taxis. Oh, okay. Oh, taxis are a great example. Have you noticed that taxis are not the most graceful at stopping? Yeah. They're like, go, 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 stop sign. Blah. You know, like the seatbelt, all that yeah. stuff happens. That's how you stopped. You need to try to stop more gradually. If you could imagine, imagine that you were driving with someone. Okay. When my... Um, I have a four-year-old, I am a dad, 
And when my four-year-old was a one-day-old, I'm like, okay, I have this eight-pound child, and I am not supposed to kill this child. I'm supposed to keep this child alive. That is my mission. Okay. And we put him in the back seat, and I'm driving my child, and my, 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 my wife is next to me, and she just had a baby, so she's like, uh... And my mother-in-law is behind me. The only thing scarier than doing something to your child is your mother-in-law. So, you know, that, there's even a term for it. I forget what it is, like something materna blah blah phobia, fear of one's mother-in-law. It's a useful term. Anyway, um, I should know what it is. And I remember as I'm driving my little boy Micah, and I see like a red light. I think I must have started slowing down like 100 feet before the red light. I'm like, okay, let's gradually slow down. There was probably a car behind me that was going crazy. Maybe they were from New York. They're like, what is wrong with this guy? I'm like, I do not want to hurt my child. Now, imagine that you are slowing down to a red light like that and not like the ubiquitous taxi cab. Okay? Okay. Try that for me. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's on the right path. Sometimes it's also good to work on rhythm by doing something like just clapping. It's an idea. Well, that was lovely to listen to. Can we move on to Schumann? What? Can we do the Wild Horseman now? Okay. Great. <laughs> piece, isn't it? I've always thought it was very exciting. Do you know um, a famous piece by Wagner called The Ride of the Valkyries? You might recognize it if I played it for you. Yeah, I don't really know songs by the names. That's fair. Um, it goes something like, um, I'll try to do a, a rough piano transcription. <laughs> Exciting piece. Does that ring a bell? I think I might have heard it once Maybe. a long time ago. It's a very popular classical piece, um, which basically means that it shows up in a commercial once every 10 years. Um, but it's but it is kind of famous and totally worth listening to, and it also shows up in, in a variety of movies. But it's a lot of fun. Check it out, right of the Valkyries. Anyway, that texture, yum ba dum ba dum really reminds me of you. I just changed the rhythm. So um, check it out. It's a lot of fun. It's an orchestral piece. It's, it's taken from a really, 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 really long opera called The Ring Cycle. If you think Lord of the Rings is long, you haven't seen The Ring Cycle. Um, <clears throat> and they're both about a ring. Um, could you make your right hand more staccato? Do you see all those stick? Oh, do you have your music with you? Mm, um, no. I think it's like in the bench. It's okay. Just take my word for it. So these notes are staccato. Can you keep them very, very short? Go ahead. Yeah, 
I think the staccatos make it feel so much more exciting, a little more dangerous. You think about like, um, do you ever ride a horse when it's running? I've done frotting. What have you done? Once, and it nearly made me cry. <laughs> well, um, you know, my last name is McDonald and all McDonald's are farmers. And so therefore I'm an expert in all things equestrian. And um, so, uh, but one thing to know about horses is when they run, their, their hoofs don't stay on the ground for very long. Okay, I'm not a farmer, but actually my grandfather was a farmer. So yes, you can tell your friends that old McDonald had a farm. And I never got made fun of for this ever. Not once, because people are nice down here. Okay, so um, listener has to be very staccato. Imagine that they're just releasing, but then there's a slur here. Yeah, slur, and then short, short, and then slur, yeah, and then short, and then staccato. Okay, so that 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 slur, that 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 slur, that 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 that. Let me give that a try. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, I wonder if we could take the left hand and shape it a little bit. Start less, and then grow, and then you. So it's like level one, level two, level three, and then fade a little bit. And that will help the overall shape. Remember how I said in the Bach that most phrases start less, they grow and they fade? Yeah. We can do that here too. So less, growing, more, and a little less. Give it a try. Yeah, absolutely. happens in the middle section here how does um what, what's something that schumann does to make this middle part different than the beginning um, he puts the melody in the left hand ding 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 we have a winner um so what do we do how do we make this clear um Play the right hand a little quieter. Yeah. You know, Serena, I always find that if I have a left hand melody, I have to bring it out more than I would bring out a right hand melody. Something about the way we humans are, I think we're just more likely to hear a melody in the right hand than we are in the left hand. We have to try a little extra hard. Also, we train ourselves to bring out our right hands. So, Bringing out the left hand is just not as natural to us. We have less practice with it. So can you try to bring out the left hand a little bit more and make the right hand a little softer? steals the melody back or is it still on the left hand there? I think it's kind of like both. Mm, okay, then let's shape the right hand a little bit. Yep. Yep. So um, basically, if you see a group of notes, always shape them. Always have some sort of growing and fading plan because it will always make it sound better. It will always make it sound more thought out. Um, let's look at the next phrase. Thank 
Right, 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 right. And and also on the left hand, you can practice the staccato touch and then lean. Yada. Best ways to make music sound interesting is to always remember this principle. Music needs a variety. If it has a variety, then it will tend to be more interesting. So when you are doing um, <clears throat> a shaping, you want to maybe start less, grow, and then fade at the end. Well, similarly, we don't want everything to be staccato. We don't want everything to be connected. We want a variety of touches. If it's all one or it's all the other, then it gets kind of boring. You know, I'm a, I'm a Texan. So I love Mexican food. One of the things I like is chips and guacamole. Do, do you like guacamole or is that weird to you? Um, kind of, but I like it with extra lemon. Extra lemon. There you go. Okay. Well, you like variety. So in other words, you don't want just a chip, right? It's yeah. nice to have something to go with it. It's like, what if I said, I would like to serve you chips with a side of chips. And here's a bowl of little crumbly chips that you can dip your chips into. Extra crunchy. You know, it just gets weird, right? You want something like varied, like if you like chips and queso, then you have like your, your you know, nice gooey, cheesy queso, maybe with a little meat thrown in, maybe some spicy jalapenos. Or... Anyway, sorry, I'm Mexican food on the mind, because thank you, COVID, I don't get to go out and eat Mexican food anymore, which is just not cool. So go away, COVID, because I want margaritas. But at any rate, we want variety. We don't want everything to be the same. And so you have your staccato notes, and then you have a slurred note. Yada. Staccato. And then the right hand takes it, and that keeps it interesting. And then we're back to the A section. And uh, just like that, we've had an exciting wild horseman ride um serena do you have any questions about any of the pieces that we worked on just now uh, either the bach or the or the wild horseman no. okay. well it was lovely hearing you play and i just encourage you to continue to listen for ways to put lots of variety in your playing so that it's just as interesting to um to people who have trouble staying focused like me variety helps me stay focused so that will help us uh, add folk to Keep our, you hold our attention to the very end. Okay. All right. Stay healthy. Thank you, Serena, for joining us again. And I uh, hope you have a uh, re good rest of the evening. Okay. Bye. Bye, Serena. Bye. Oof. That was so fun. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed by the way uh, you were able to get through the technical difficulties. And I, I guess it, it, it got better at the, towards the end. It did get better. Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe somebody was watching Netflix in the back. So, you know what? <laughs> this, this episode will have to wait. You know, when I'm teaching online these days, um, you know, some, some people, uh, some, some students, they, they, they have a really good environment. But some, I, I always sometimes hear, you know, people, uh, you know, watching TV in the background, talking, talking on the phone. And it's just, it's just... It's such a uh, uh, interesting environment that the kids mm -hmm. we we have I we always have to remember as teachers I think how it's not always you know these kids don't always grow up the same way we did which uh, at least my parents you know, gave me the absolute you know the best possible environment for me to practice in and every uh, every day so but not every kid get that <laughs> that's that's very true. You know, apparently, one thing that I've learned that I have not tried, but apparently, you can you can set people's routers so that it will prioritize certain devices. I haven't tried oh. this yet, but there I don't know if it's only certain routers that do this, but I know that it's a thing. So it could like prioritize the computer or tablet through which you're teaching the lesson, so that if somebody else is watching TV or something, it will not necessarily hurt the lesson as much. So I had no idea that I that was. I heard about this from I a think. friend of mine, but it's worth um, worth looking into. It definitely is. But I had, although I had a feeling that if people, you know, the serious students, they always, they, they, the, their parents would make way. And, and I guess I would probably stop doing things, uh, you know, that that would disrupt the internet, of course. Sure, sure, but of course. but the, the, the people that don't care, 
they probably wouldn't bother <laughs> setting the router anyway, right? <laughs> but it's good to it's it's good for teachers as well, just to just to know that when you're teaching maybe your spouse or your parents, whoever, they don't have to cut their their Netflix for that <laughs> for that duration. <laughs> they might just have a slightly lower lower video quality. Right. They'll have to, to bear bear with that. <laughs> Are you seeing but, anybody in person these days or is everything online right now? I think everything is pretty much online. I, I do have to do I do have to walk my dog, otherwise he will go crazy. Um, and sometimes I would have to do, you know, grocery shopping uh, when when Amazon runs out. So, mm -hmm. but I, I I wear a mask, and people please wear masks. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, yeah, completely agree. In any case, uh, it was such a fun hour, uh, a little over an hour with you. Uh, thank, you so thank you so much. Thank you so much for 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 joining us we we appreciate um uh, you and and of course all of, all of the other teachers and students joining us um we've connected i think you know i think at this point probably close to you know 60 70 students mm -hmm. um um we're through our showcase and our master class and and we and with you know around 20 teachers so far and I, we hope to do more uh, to build cool. that connection between between students and teachers, you know, through this new way of communication. So, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Thanks <laughs> thank for you. having me. You're doing mm -hmm. wonderful work here. Thank you. And of course, every Tuesday. So next Tuesday we have an, uh, another uh, wonderful class. So um, you can sign up or uh, you know at least subscribe. You can subscribe to our channels, like our Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter page uh, to stay on top of all the other masterclass. Without further ado, that's it for today. Happy practicing, everyone. And practicing. we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>